Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I applaud you guys all for coming today. Uh, uh, my name is Jennifer Marsman. Uh, please don't crucify me, but I do work for Microsoft. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, so I love coming out to do things um, with the Linux community. Um, and so once in a while, you will have to forgive me because I might be say something really stupid. Like once in a while, I still get in fights with people. Like I say Linux, and they're like, it's Linux. And then I'll say Linux, and then someone else will be like, it's Linux. And I'm, like, oh, I'm sorry. What you, whatever you say is probably right. Um, I would definitely, I'm sure everyone has more, more Linux knowledge than I do. I did have worked for, um, I did a bunch of Linux in college. Um, and I am now at Microsoft, so I've obviously been on Windows for, for a time now. Uh, but I'm a fan, uh, and so now I'm really excited to share like the fact that Microsoft has become more and more and more kind of open. I think we've been turning, uh, kind of turning the mothership, turning the battleship for a little while now. And now with kind of Sasha at the helm, it's even more kind of moving forward uh, in this open direction, which is something I'm personally really excited about. So today what I was going to focus on was cloud and our cloud story and specifically Azure. And Azure for a long time, I mean, has, has always been a very open platform. And even just like um, in my interactions working with the team, um, I, I you work with the Windows team and like I work for Microsoft and yet they still, you know, don't want to say anything about anything. They're very, very closed. And then uh, you, you work with the Azure team, they'd be like, oh yeah, this is coming, this is coming. I mean, they'd be, they're really, really open, willing to share, just in terms of the culture as well um, for a long time. Just a little kind of inside information there. Um, so my, my background, I did go to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Go Blue! Yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. Um, I graduated um, in 2000 with my bachelor's degree and 2001 with my master's degree um, in computer engineering. And I did drop out after the master's, but all of my friends have PhDs. Like my husband has a PhD and all my friends have PhDs. So I'm like the Howard Wall of it, so our group of friends, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Um, with only a master's degree. So, um, but uh, I do have my contact information up there right now. Uh, I was out in Redmond after college at U of M. I went out to Microsoft's main campus in Redmond, and I was a developer there for like, kind of the first half of my career. And then when my husband and I were ready to have kids, we moved back here because we, we both grew up in the Michigan area. Um, I was actually born in Ann Arbor, and my husband is from uh, Grand Rapids area. And so we wanted our kids to know their grandparents and all that. So that's when we moved back. And at that point, um, I took this role called the Developer Evangelist. And I know that's probably one of the most ridiculous titles you have heard if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not familiar with that. But it's actually one of the coolest jobs in the company. Um, I get paid to play with all the cool new stuff for developers and then go out and talk to people about them. So I get to play with um, you know, our latest stuff, cloud computing, um, Windows development, Windows phone development, kind of all this stuff. I contribute to open source, I put stuff on GitHub, I blog, I tweet, I webcast, all of that kind of good stuff. I just kind of spread the word and, and try to Kind of part trainer, part a lot of different things, but it's kind of fun uh, in terms of it's got the social element and it also uh, lets me uh, get my hands dirty with a lot of different kind of coding on the cutting edge too. So a lot of fun. So if you do have questions afterwards or things you think of that you didn't get a chance to ask, feel free. I have a blog. It's blogs.msdn.com with Jennifer. And I also am on Twitter. So feel free to reach out to me however you're most comfortable. Um, the blog does have like an email the blog author or contact me or some kind of button in the right sidebar you can click and that'll get through to me too. All right, so today we're going to talk about cloud and open source at Microsoft, which oh, Azure doesn't. And I know you might be thinking, open source at Microsoft, two kind of drastically different things uh, from what we've heard. Um, but I will tell you, it is not actually um, end of days. It, this is something that is real and that we are trying really hard at Microsoft to, uh, to embrace. Um, and so our commitment uh, to open source, I, I think, I think it's been shown over over time. We are a, we've always been, I think, a partner company. Um, when you think about a company uh, like Apple, where Apple makes the hardware, Apple makes the software, Apple kind of owns the entire experience. Like they can kind of be closed off and still do a good job. Microsoft, that's not the case. Um, we have worked with partners for forever. We've had to partner with Intel. We have to partner with Dell. We have to partner with everyone to make sure that Windows is is running properly. Um, there's you know a whole bunch of people who trade on our staff. We have partners. I think. I'm trying to remember the 
stat. I think it's like for every dollar Microsoft makes, Microsoft partners make eight dollars or something like that. There's something ridiculous like that. Don't quote me on that because I'm not sure if that's number. But it was something like that. That Microsoft partners, we just have a thriving partner ecosystem, which we've always uh, tried to support. And so uh, we were kind of uh, open to working with lots of different people. And I think you can see that most clearly in Azure because honestly, with Azure, there is support for everything. And I'm going to walk through some of that in more detail in just a second. Um, I love this slide. I love this picture so much. So this is Sasha, and there's actually a great big Microsoft Heart Linux like right there on the stage behind him at a, a major conference. And um, it, it's really cool. This is a quote from him. Uh, if you look at Azure, you can be on the Mac using it. You can use Node to build a first-class Azure app. You can be on Python, you can use uh, PHP, uh, there's a variety of languages supported. And then obviously we have Linux in terms of a guest um, OS that you can utilize. And so this all adds to the flexibility and richness of the platform. So with, with Azure, they really want you to be able to run anything up there. So it, they, we've been very open and embracing of trying to get everybody, um, everybody up there who wants to play. All right, so this is the big slide I want to walk through. Uh, I, I love this because this kind of shows a lot of what's, what we have available kind of all in one place. So Microsoft Azure really is this open, open cloud, and I've kind of split this into two parts. There's the stuff that's kind of integrated into um, Azure right now, meaning you can go to the Azure portal and just click this. But then we also have galleries that the, the community can contribute to. And so there's a lot of things that doesn't have official Microsoft support yet, and sometimes it's going to actually get sucked in later. We just haven't had cycles to get it pulled in officially yet. Um, but the community has contributed, and that gives us um, the support on there anyway. And so I can kind of walk through some of these briefly. Um, in terms of languages, dev tools, app containers, all of that, we have support for .NET, so you can write uh, your VB.NET and your C-sharp code and all of that stuff, run that on Azure, no problem. But there's also support for PHP and Python, and then Ruby in the ecosystem as well. Um, Node.js is huge. Um, Windows Azure Mobile Services, which I'm going to talk about later, um, is, was written completely in Node. Um, so huge, huge support um, across languages. Java also runs there. Um, and then uh, there's support for Docker, or all kinds of other good stuff there. And then in terms of CMSs, um, we have support for WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, um, a lot of the major PHP um, CMSs are all supported out there as well. Um, device support, so I mentioned Windows Azure Mobile Services. That is a kind of a back end as a service uh, for a mobile app to utilize. Um, and that is that has support for Android, iOS, the Windows Phone, as well as Windows Store type applications, uh, which you can run just on a regular Windows 8 or up machine. And then finally, we have uh, databases. So SQL Server, of course, is supported. There's also support for Oracle. I actually think this slide is out of date. Oracle should probably be over on the Microsoft integrated side now. Um, I'm pretty sure that's one of the standard things. There's a ton of support for Hadoop. Um, if any of you guys are doing big data, anyone doing big data here? Okay, nice, nice. Okay, cool. And then um, Redis, caching, there's support for that. Um, all kinds of good stuff uh, available. And then um, MongoDB support as well, ClearDB, MySQL, um, a lot of other things are added on through community support. And then management, so there's support for Chef and Puppet and a lot of those guys, um, as well as others. And then in terms of operating systems, we have uh, support for Windows and um, a whole bunch of different uh, Linux distributions. So what I want to do now is kind of dive a little deeper and kind of show you how you might do some of these things um, uh, across the different um, across the different things. So I'm going to start with virtual machines because Azure is huge. There's so many different things you can do with it. So I'm going to talk about I think it's virtual machines, um, websites, uh, the big data, the Hadoop stuff, and there's one other thing I'm not forgetting. And then I also want to jump in and just show you the machine learning really quick just because I think it's really cool. Uh, so we'll try to go in through and, and just kind of give you a taste of some of what and. and that doesn't even encompass all of it because Azure has just been exploding. Uh, I think they, they ship a new feature every, like, it's, it's extremely long. Okay, so virtual machines, we'll start with virtual machines. So in a cloud scenario, oftentimes you just want to take some code and run it in a virtual machine in a cloud and have it be cloud-based because in that scenario, you can crank up the dial as needed and then if you know, you're able to handle a larger amount of traffic, but then, if your traffic should dip down, you can turn the dial back down again, and then you're paying less money. So, one of the, the huge uh, advantages of cloud. And so, we do have support for Windows Server, um, but for the folks in this room, uh, what you're going to care about is all the support for all of the different Linux options. And there are a lot of them. So, I'll go through and show you um, a little bit of this book. There's a, a whole bunch of different distributions, um, Ubuntu, SUSE, uh, CentOS, all kinds of good stuff. 
Um, just out of curiosity, what are the cool distros right now? Can I get a sense of what people, can you guys just yell out what you're using right now? Red Hat Enterprise. Red Hat, okay. We don't have support for Red Hat yet, but we want it. So right now Red Hat is trying, they have to get certified on our environment, and so my understanding is that it's in process right now, but it hasn't happened yet. So we don't have Red Hat on board totally, but there is other like CentOS stuff you can use. Um, Debian, so I, so that's a really good one because I was actually looking, I swear I've seen Debian on there before, and then I went back and tried to find it today and I, I couldn't. <laughs> so I think, I'm pretty sure it's up there and I'm just not sure where I can find it, but let me let me follow up with whoever said Debian and um, I will see if I can find it. Otherwise, I know you can do it because with, um, with our virtual machines, if it's not, if there's an image up there that you want to use already, Basically, you can build your own and upload it, and then have your own images there as well, and contribute them to. We have a community gallery, so people are contributing stuff um, all the time, and can be shared with others as well. Um, and I know, I swear, I've seen it before. So you said something about cer certifying. Yes. Before. Okay, so I can't just throw something in a community place that you have the. You can. I think because Red Hat has the enterprise store, like they want some kind of official. There's something official that has to happen there. Um, but when there's, so there, there's also stuff that's built in and stuff that's community, uh, um, and, and we want it kind of built in Microsoft Store. So let me show you an example. I'm about to kind of dive into it and I'll show you kind of the difference. But there are some things that are like uploaded by the community and then there's, you can see who uploaded it and kind of determine if you trust that, that publisher um, before you download the image. And then some things that are like the official Microsoft supported, which if some people don't trust, you know, they can download the ones that we vetted are okay. Um, as well, so it's whatever you whatever you choose. But I'll show you that in one second. I'm going to dive into it and show you how you would do that. All right. So that's the part that I wanted to mention. The, here's the the VM Depot. So this used to be separate, uh, where you have to go to a web page and you can see kind of all the different things that were available there. But now it's actually integrated um, right into the um, Windows Azure portal. So you can go into Azure. You can see. Uh, you can click and, and choose an image right there from. Um, from the, the gallery and see all the different things that are available. So it's a growing um, growing set of, th I might have probably saw the Debian in there somewhere because I swear I've seen it. Um, and it made me really mad because I was actually looking for it earlier today. I'm like, somebody's going to say Debian. i got to go find it just to verify that I couldn't find it. I know it's in there. Um, but it's licensed and supported by the community. So these are all community images uploaded by the community, which you can choose to share. And I think all of us that are comfortable with open source are, are fairly comfortable with doing that. Um, but they are integrated with the Microsoft Azure portal experience. So you can just go to the portal and download and be able to grab stuff from the, from there. All right, this is the screenshot I put in there because I wasn't sure how the internet was going to work and I like to be over prepared. But let me jump on here and I will go um, straight from here and see if I can show you this stuff live inside. Um, okay. That's a search engine called Bing. <laughs> it's really good. You guys, has anyone heard of it? It's awesome. You should use it. Dude, dude, Google has so many tools. You can't even throw that down. Uh, you guys are like the king of installing extra junk. Um, okay, so I'm waiting for this to come up. Uh, you know what? I think I have Chrome and IE open at the same time, and they tend to fight with each other. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, I'll go Chrome because I'm in front of this audience. Let's do this. It could be that. Too. And is it manage? Um, let me even see. I don't even know what it is. I just do manage dot Windows Azure. Oh, there we go. Now it's up. Let's do that. Okay, I have a million subscriptions that I'm hooking into right now, so you're going to see just a ton of stuff here. But this is what the portal looks like right now. Um, I have three different subscriptions that I'm part of, so it's just dumping and some of them are team things, so a lot of, there's a lot of uh, VMs right here. But basically, if I wanted to, it kind of, when you start here, it's on all items, so it's showing everything that I have created on Azure, which is a lot of junk. Um, and then you can kind of scale, filter down by like, all the different things that are available. So there's web apps, so that's where you can just take a website and it, it doesn't have to be just you know, ASP.NET, which is Microsoft's thing, but your PHP, your Python, whatever, you can build and then upload it and run it as a web app. Um, virtual machines, so this is what we were talking about first. So let me click on this, and there's a ton of VMs here. And so if I wanted to create a new VM, I can just go here, click on new, and it'll grab a new thing. So there's, there's two different options. This from gallery is your community stuff, and this quick create is the Microsoft own stuff. So if I hit quick create here, 
I can throw in some name, and this has to be uh, globally unique because it's going to be something .net is where I'll be able to access it from. So I would have to put like Gen VM and see if there's any other gens who have a VM. No, <laughs> sad state of women in technology. There's no other gen. <laughs> okay. okay, nice. So um, and then right here you can click on the image, and here are some of the images. I know it's kind of hard to read. But here's some of the images that are available. There's a couple different Windows Server ones, about five there at the top. Then we've got our Ubuntu's, and there's a variety of different versions here that you see. Um, some OpenLogic, some Oracle Linux, CoreOS, um, SUSE. I, I'm, am I saying it right? I, I, this is another one. Suze? Susa. Susa. Like John Philip Susa. Okay, sorry, this is another one where it's like you're always saying it wrong. Yeah, okay, Susa then. Here's my Susa. And, um, and then a variety of different things. So here are some of the ones that you can just grab kind of out of the box. Um, and then you set up what size you want. And there's a variety of sizes. As you can know, there's, there's basic, standard, and different kind of support options available, different pricing for all of those. And then you just give it a username and a password to be able to connect to it and define your own. And then you can also set where you want it to, um, to live. So we have a variety of data centers all over the world. Um, and we, you can set which one you want it to live in. So uh, you can see some of the ones that they have available here. East US, uh, Central US, uh, North Central, South Central. Um, the Central US, or the, so one of these is in Chicago, so that's probably the closest one for us. Um, West US, there's Brazil, a couple in uh, Europe, a couple in Asia, Australia, so a whole bunch of different uh, versions. And then I'm not going to talk about uh, CDNs today, but we also have that so you can get a good global experience and be able to cache things locally um, as well. All right, so I can do that and then create a virtual machine like that. Or if I don't see what I want here and I want to develop something else, I can click this from gallery. And that will give me that integrated experience and jump me right into the, that VM depot, which is now kind of integrated right here into the portal. And so you see there's a whole bunch of Microsoft stuff at first. So you can grab a couple of just different Windows Server OSs like so, or you can grab it with like SharePoint or BizTalk or um, Visual Studio or anything like that already installed. But then we have some, um, some Ubuntu, some CoreOS, uh, uh, some CentOS based, um, your, your SUS, SUSAs <laughs> right there, uh, Oracle Puppet Labs, all kinds of other great stuff. Then you also have the ability to upload your own images. So you can create your own images and upload, um, uh, create a, a VHD and then be able to make an image from that, upload that to the cloud, and then it will take care of the process of kind of having a master copy of your image and setting up the number of times you want it to scale based off of that VHD, and then um, it will be doing the monitoring. So if anything becomes not pingable or goes down for any reason or there's hard drive failure or whatever, it will notice that, take that down, and spin up another one immediately so that you consistently have the number that you've, um, you've asked to have up going. So um, here's, and then here's where you would see all the images and all the disks that you've uploaded yourself are all available right there. So you can go through, select one of these, uh, configure it exactly how you want, how many instances you want, um, all of that sort of thing, how you want to scale, where, what region you want it located in, all of that good stuff. Okay? So that's the virtual machine story. Let's jump back here. The buy, uh, and here's kind of my screenshot that I was doing just in case. <laughs> and right here we have some of the different options uh, in, the, in the VM or in the um, community distribution. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about is Hadoop. So uh, for those of you who aren't in the big data space, um, one of the kind of primary ways of doing big data, one of the great uh, open source primary tools for doing big data is Apache Hadoop. And there's kind of a whole ecosystem around that. Uh, there's Hadoop that allows you to do big data kind of batch processing. Um, there's something called a Storm, which allows you to kind of do real-time streaming, um, really cool stuff there. Uh, there's HBase, which is a, a database. It's like a NoSQL kind of big table-like database uh, to allow you to do uh, kind of the data uh, that scales up. And so we have support for all of that. Um, and we also do have support for Hadoop not only running on uh, a Windows virtual machine, but Hadoop on Linux support was, um, is in there as well. So you can just do file new and create a new uh, Hadoop on Linux um, distro, and it will be running Linux up in our cloud as well. So it's great, you can scale elastically on demand, you can crunch all kinds of data, um, you can develop in Java, C Sharp, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, we have some neat kind of tie-ins with Excel, so if you want to make it easier to visualize, you can dump it into Excel very easily and, and visualize it. 
And then we also have a nice kind of um, on-prem, off-prem story where if you have some Hadoop clusters that you really you want to keep in your own data center and then maybe you scale out and do some Hadoop processing in our cloud as well, you can actually use them together, which is a nice, um, a nice feature. And then there's a lot of uh, NoSQL type support, transactional support as well, and the HBase does support that. Um, okay, I'm sorry. And so here's, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you work together? Say, say that one more time. Yeah, what do you say? Work together in Hadoop and Hadoop and HBase. So HBase is the the, the um, database kind of the new school database processing. So you can set up HBase clusters. Oh, well. okay. yeah. Sorry, if that wasn't clear. Um, so here's my screenshot, but let me jump and show this to you for realsies. Um, we'll jump out of our virtual machines and then jump down into the Hadoop support. And the Hadoop on Azure, our official like product name for it is HD Insight. So if you scroll down to the HD Insight um, section, you'll see a bunch of uh, big data stuff I have running here. And if I go new here, it'll take you, if you do it right from that right filtered place, it'll jump and already take you to the right place. But you can see we have support for um, Hadoop. And when you choose this option, this Hadoop option, it'll create a Hadoop cluster for you on a Windows virtual machine by default. Um, and then there's HBase as well, which is the, the, no, um, the NoSQL database, uh, it's part of the Apache ecosystem as well. Um, Storm, this is also part of the Apache's Hadoop ecosystem. Um, that's the one that does the real, real-time data streaming and real-time processing. So if you have like, you know, a medical need where, you know, as you're streaming all the data that are coming off of the, you know, a person in the hospital has a million different sensors on them and you're streaming all that data somewhere and then can make, um, you know, smart decisions based on, okay, we're seeing these levels falling and when those levels fall, we tend to have a cardiac incident you know, an hour later or whatever. So you need kind of that data in real time. A technology like Storm is a good, a good choice for that because um, it can handle the, the big data, that, that amount of traffic. There's also Spark. Uh, Spark is still in preview. That's uh, for like in-memory processing type stuff. So it can do some neat stuff uh, kind of all in memory. So it's really fast. And then um, Hadoop on Linux. So here's the Hadoop on Linux option uh, that we announced. And it's in preview right now, but it's, it's uh, it's working pretty well, so it's, it's exciting, it's really exciting stuff. And then I think they want to expand event and you know, make sure we have everything that's Storm and stuff on, on Linux as well. So that's kind of the new thing. And do you guys mind, okay, so this is slightly off topic, but I'm hoping you will indulge me. Um, so I was at a hackathon uh, last week, it was, and I'm, I've been really getting into this big data stuff and trying to like learn more, really get up to speed with this, because. You know, I, I have the coolest job in the world where I get to just play with new tech, and so like big data is like where I wanted to focus. And so um, we all kind of, I, I got together with this team at this hackathon, and we tried to, we wanted to decide, you know, something cool to do, we wanted it to be around big data. So we were trying to think of a neat problem to solve. And this was actually on Tuesday, April 15th, and I don't know if any of you guys are Game of Thrones fans, but um, I kind of am, and we were, uh, this was like uh, two days after the Game of Thrones you know, season premiere, and none of us had watched it yet. We all had a DVR, but we hadn't watched it yet. And we were saying, you know, oh my gosh, you know, part of the fun of uh, sometimes watching something that has a cult following like that is getting to see kind of the real time Twitter feed as the event is happening, you know, what are people saying and, and such. And that's true not only for Game of Thrones, but, you know, if you're a sports person, then, you know, watching the game in real time and seeing the fans make comments or if you're a reality TV person, which I am not, um, but if you <laughs> like to watch people get voted off of shows and have comments and like to give your opinion on such things, that's also fun to watch in real time. So this kind of a variety of different things. And so for us, it was like we were all like Game of Thrones people, and so we were like, okay, since we want to solve, you know, the world's hardest problems at this hackathon, why don't we use big data processing, mine Twitter, suck in a whole bunch of data, and then be able to watch and replay Twitter as it was during the Game of Thrones premiere. So that way you can set it time and like watch things as they're coming. So that's what we built. <laughs> let me just show you out, let me, here, I have a, I have a blog post that I'm gonna do on, that's coming out soon on uh, what we did, no. So let me just show you the architecture diagram real quick, what we were doing. So basically we grabbed like this Twitter um, API package and so we're sucking in data from Twitter and we actually had two different data polls um, one data poll um, was historical data, so that was right here, this archive job, which we just wrote in C-sharp, and that was basically because the, the Game of Thrones season premiere had already passed, so we needed to go back and mine that historical data that had already happened um, to be able to have that as part, of our, um, as part of our data set. And then I wrote this part, which was the storm part, and so with the storm,
store part, what we did, or what I did was uh, write, um, write kind of the real time. So I was you know, sucking in data from Twitter real time and um, being able to put that, both of these things, both the, the real time and the archive, we put it into an HBase database, so it's the big data friendly uh, database. And then all of that was put in front of a website, which is data DVR. And let me, I, I cached this just in case it wasn't working, but let me, let me see if I can do it for you live right here, datadvr.com. And I am using Chrome just for you guys. Look at this love. I know, I know. It's a real, it's a real part of me. But so if I go to April 12th, uh, 2015, and then because of a UTC time and the time we like in the, I have to do 4 p.m. instead of the actual time, but trust me, it's the right time. Um, we just had kind of an error when we were sucking the historical data in. And now you can see this is the actual Twitter stream that was happening at 4 o'clock. And if we let, I'm going to let it run for at least a minute because this time we'll update in real time to show you the actual time. So after one minute's worth of tweets come through, it will change to 401 so you can see stuff. But you can look, let me pause it for a second. You can see here, kids have been sent to their rooms, TV turned to HBO, assumed comfortable position, Game of Thrones season premiere, I am ready for you. <laughs> Game of Thrones time, taking bets, how long into the show will we see blood? I see nine minutes. Game of Thrones finally! So like if you look at these things, you can see these are what's like, it's time! Hashtag Game of Thrones. Winter is coming, you know, all these things that you can see, this is what was actually happening, you know, in real time, like when, uh, when we, uh, when the, the, the uh, premiere was coming out. Jen, have you uh, open sourced the stuff that you wrote? Yeah, it's all on GitHub. Yeah, I, I put everything on GitHub. So I'm happy to show you guys the link. And actually, there's one more file that I need to check in because I checked in. Um, th there's the, po the file that had all the passwords in it to all of our, Hadoop, or all of our um, Azure clusters uh, was not checked in. Uh, so I need to check in like a dummy file that says replace this with your own like Azure information and then, um, and then stick it up there. But once that's in, then it should all work. Right now, it may not actually compile. And it all, I want to go back and clean it, but I'm actually going to do that on Monday. I have time set to do that because I think there's a conference next week where we're going to be demoing this. Uh, so <laughs> I have to clean up the code real quick before people actually start pulling it. But I will give you the code, as, or I'll give you the link as long as you promise not to, to like wait a day before you pull. Wait until like Wednesday and then pull. Yes? Um. I work at a Microsoft shop, and yeah. so I'm constantly, and I'm into the big data thing. Yeah, yeah. And of course, my database guy is like, yeah. like this mm -hmm. um, How does SQL Azure compare to Hadoop, or is that even fair comparison? Yeah, so Hadoop was really built for, for big data. I mean, SQL, SQL Azure can, can, um, can do a lot of that stuff, but SQL Azure is still a fully relational database. And so right. when you have a fully relational database and you have support for joins and you have support for you know, foreign key constraints and all that good stuff, right. that is just by nature going to be slower and is not going to scale as well and, and everything. So Microsoft, I think one of the things that we do um, is we are crazy about giving people choices. Like, right. yeah, I do this, and then it ends up confusing our customers because they see, okay, there's these three different options. Right. Now, how do I choose how to do something? But really, SQL is the best choice. SQL Azure is the best choice if you wanted a full-on relational database. Um, Hadoop is not like relational. This is not relational. Right. Software. But I yeah. heard that in since the Azure world, you get um, a table span across several machines. That, yeah. You know, like in no suites, you yeah. can relax the transaction yeah. constraints. Yeah, so it is, it is very, very scalable. So there are some differences between the SQL Server that runs like on your machine like locally and SQL Azure in the cloud. Like they did change a few things to make it way more scalable. scalable. Right. Yeah, um, but it is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it still gives you the relational stuff that, that you need. And you want to run SQL Azure local, mm -hmm. is that an option or is that not yet? So there is something where you can like buy a little Azure like racky thing and okay. have it in your data center. Um, but I'd want to have a conversation with you first. Because uh, remember, I mean, what you're getting, one of the benefits you're getting from the cloud is the ability to just turn it up and turn it back down. And a lot of right, people, I mean, right. a lot, so many people say, okay, I really want this, but I want it right here where I can see it and touch it and hold it and feel it and hug it. And right. that's right. not like, you're kind of losing some of your cloud benefits by, by doing that. And it's I know. It's to push military data, so it's Yeah, yeah. And, and so. I understand it. We, there's a whole bunch of different like certifications that we've passed and stuff like that. So some of the, these things are you know okay to put in the cloud and, and some aren't. So let's have a one-on-one -on -one talk afterwards so we can actually talk about. Yes, sir. Uh, so you showed that you're going from a Twitter API to uh, your 
the, your straight C sharp data from, from the Game of Thrones episode. Yeah. But also the storm. Yeah. Is the storm for current stuff then? Yes. Yeah, so the okay. core. So let me let me pause this now. So you can see it's actually on 403 now. So we've we we're we're processing. We're continuing to do the thing. I'll pause it there so it doesn't keep doing. It. But yes. Yeah, so what I wrote was the the storm piece, and storm is the real time. So I was basically pulling uh, my thing, it's not running right now, but um, what my piece does is it created something in Storm. And the way Storm works, in case anyone is curious, is they have, there's a concept of spouts. So that's where you kind of suck data in at the beginning and then spouts emit something. And then there's this concept of something called a bolt. And bolts um, uh, can accept data and then they can emit data out the other end. And so you create something in Storm called a topology where it's basically a workflow of Spout, spout at the beginning and then bolts through. And so I grabbed, there was an existing H-based